Welcome to lecture 28. Today we're going to talk about a exact time-ordered product that we can calculate. One of the things that you probably have noticed as we've been talking about time-ordered products is that we can formally write down an equation for what the time-ordered product is, but actually determining analytically what a given time-ordered product will be is a rather challenging problem to work out. This example that we're going to talk about, which is a driven simple harmonic oscillator, is one of the few cases where one has a non-trivial time-ordered product, yet we can actually determine exactly what the time-ordered product is. But before we jump into deriving the time-ordered product, we're going to start by focusing on understanding the complexity of the problem itself. So we're going to start by looking at our Hamiltonian and as we described before we think of that as composed of two pieces an h0 which is time independent and a v of t which depends on time and in some sense that v of t must be small but it can be a large interaction that acts over a short period of time and that would still end up having a net effect that is small Okay, for a simple harmonic oscillator, the H0 is simple. We're working in the raising and lowering operator representation. It's equal to H bar omega A dagger A plus a half. And our potential is going to be something that's called a harmonic potential. It's the sum of two terms. One of the terms is the dagger or Hermitian conjugate of the other term. So we're going to write it as F of T multiplied by A dagger plus F star of T multiplied by A. And just as a reminder, the commutator of A with A dagger is equal to 1 for the simple harmonic oscillator. Now if we look at this potential, in the situations when we look at the real part of F, that's going to be coupled to an A plus A dagger, and that's proportional to X. And in that case, it acts as if we are moving the zero of the simple harmonic oscillator as a function of time. Some of you may have seen some driven harmonic oscillator demonstrations where the harmonic oscillator point of contact, where, where say you, the spring is attached to a wall, where that might actually be being driven back and forth as a function of time. Notice further that if we look at the imaginary part of f of t, that's going to be coupled to a dagger minus a, and that's going to be a coupling to the momentum. So it's as if we're giving the system a push that's a time-dependent push as a function of time as well. So both of those are actually present in the potential that we are applying to the system. Okay, the first thing that we might want to do, if we look at this, it looks dramatically like part of a square. And so we might think, well, let, look, let's define a new operator. We're going to call it capital A. It's equal to our old lowering operator A plus F of T over H bar omega. And if I then calculate the commutator of A with A dagger, capital A with capital A dagger, that's going to be the same as the commutator of A with A dagger, and it's going to equal 1. And that's because F of T is just a function. It's not an operator. So it's not going to change any of the commutation relations of the operators. Now, if we calculate H bar omega A dagger A plus a half, you see it's going to equal H bar omega little A dagger A plus a dagger times f of t over h bar omega plus a times f star of t over h bar omega plus a fourth term which is the modulus squared of f of t over h bar omega squared and then of course we have the plus one half which is the trailing constant that we have in the expression we were evaluating so it takes just two seconds to recognize that that's equal to our full time dependent Hamiltonian h of t plus this time-dependent function, f of t squared over h bar omega. So we can just subtract that off, and we find that we have this nice expression for h of t. It's equal to h bar omega, capital A dagger, capital A, plus a half, minus the modulus of f of t squared divided by h bar omega. All right, so how can we try to solve such a problem? It looks like we have removed the time dependence from the operators themselves, but of course we're going to see that it's that's just a notational issue. I could have written that as capital A of T because those operators do depend on time, and that's going to play a role in how we are going to look at trying to solve the problem. All right, nevertheless, we have a lot of experience with these kinds of problems. 
we're going to define the vacuum state to satisfy A acting on the vacuum state is equal to zero. And we're going to define the excited state simply by N is equal to A dagger raised to the nth power divided by the square root of N factorial acting on that vacuum state. We know those are energy eigenstates of this Hamiltonian, or if you like, they're instantaneous energy eigenstates. So when we apply H of T onto one of those states N, we're going to get EN of T times the state N, where EN of T is just equal to H bar omega times N plus a half minus the modulus of F of T squared over H bar omega, that whole thing multiplied by the state N. Notice we call this En of t, it does depend on time, and so this is not a stationary state. It is an eigenstate, it's an instantaneous eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Alright, so what do we do if we have a general solution psi of t that we want to work with? Well, we're going to express that as a sum over these eigenstates. We write that as a sum over n, cn of t times the states n. These states n do depend on time, as we've been discussing. And the coefficients will also explicitly depend on time. So now we just plug into the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. ih bar d by dt of psi of t. That's going to pick up two terms. I'm going to get a ih bar dcn of t with respect to t multiplied by the state n. And then I'm going to have in addition a term cn of t times the time derivative of the state n. And of course that has to equal h acting on the state psi of t. Now we know what h acting on the state psi of t is. It's just en of t times the state uh, n, and so we get this nice expression, sum over n ih bar dcn of t by dt multiplied by the state n plus cn of t d by dt of the state n is equal to the sum over n cn of t en of t times the state n. Now this is something that we actually worked out in the first lecture when we were talking about time-dependent problems. We worked with re-expressing the Hamiltonian in this instantaneous time basis. It's just here because we have an explicit expression for the eigenfunctions, we actually can calculate these derivatives of the states with respect to time. And that's what we're going to get to next. Our first step, of course, is to re-express this equation by multiplying by a bra m from the left and recalling that mn is equal to delta mn for all time as long as those two states are evaluated at exactly the same time. And of course, we're going to be multiplying by m evaluated at the same time t as the psi of t is being evaluated. And then when you pull out the coefficients, you find what you get is i h bar d c m of t with respect to time plus i h bar sum over n c n of t matrix element m derivative with respect to time of n, that whole thing will equal e m of t c m of t. Now, if you remember last time, we really got stuck with trying to evaluate this derivative of the state, this matrix element that involved the derivative of the state with respect to time. We didn't really know how to do that. But as I mentioned above, now is a situation where we actually do know how to do that. So let's evaluate that derivative. It's equal to the derivative with respect to time of a dagger raised to the nth power divided by square root of n factorial acting on the vacuum state. This is going to have two terms that depend on time. In order to see that, let's first re-express the capital A dagger in terms of the little a dagger. We'll get then A dagger plus F star of T over H bar omega raised to the nth power divided by square root of n factorial, all acting on the state zero. And we can now take the derivative. We're going to get an N. We're going to get an A dagger plus F star of T over H bar omega to the N minus one power divided by square root of N factorial. We're going to get the derivative of a dagger plus f of t over h bar omega. That's going to give me df star dt over h bar omega. And all of that is acting on the state 0. And then we're going to get another term, which is going to be a dagger to the n over square root of n factorial, the time derivative of the ground state 0. Okay, now using the fact that we know what the state n is and the fact that now this new state looks like a dagger raised to the n minus 1, we can immediately write down what that first term is. It's going to, we're going to have a square root of n, because I need to have in the denominator a square root of n minus 1 factorial, so I use a square root of n to cancel one factor of square root of n in the denominator. I'm left with a square root of n in the numerator. I have an h bar omega in the denominator. I have a df star with respect to t, and I'm left with the state that we call n minus 1. 
And then in addition, I have this term that involves the derivative of the ground state. So let's try and work out what the derivative of the ground state is. We have to go back to the defining relation. The defining relation is that a acting on the ground state is equal to zero. Let's take the derivative of that. We substitute in what a is. a is just a hat plus f of t divided by h bar omega. And I take the time derivative of that. I'm going to get two terms. One when the time derivative hits the f of t. That's going to give me df dt over h bar omega times the state zero and one where the derivative acts on the state. So I'll get a plus f of t over h bar omega times the time derivative of zero. And of course that whole thing equals zero because I have a zero on the right hand side for all times. And again, whenever we have these kinds of wave function equations, we want to isolate the terms. We're going to multiply by an m on the left hand side. The first term will only give us a non-zero answer when m is equal to zero, so there's a Kronecker delta m zero that we get from that. And then the last term is going to be m operator a hat d by dt acting on the state zero, and we know the sum of both those terms will equal zero. Okay, so what we're going to next do is we're going to act the a on the state m on the left-hand side. Now remember, the a operator actually raises the state on that side. So when we act the a on that side, we're going to get square root of m plus 1 times the state m plus 1, and that's overlapped with the time derivative of the ground state. And of course, that will equal minus df of t by dt over h bar omega delta m0. So of course, that means that this overlap is 0 for every state except in the case where m is equal to 0. When m is equal to 0, that means that the bra on the left hand side is going to equal 1. And so what we find is the only term that is non-zero for that derivative is when the bra is equal to 1. That means that time derivative is proportional to the 1 state. And let's figure out exactly what that proportionality is. Well we get it right from our equation. We find the time derivative with respect to time of the state 0 is just minus df dt divided by h bar omega times the state 1. Okay, we can now take this and plug it back into our equation. So what we find now is the time derivative of the state n is equal to square root of n over h bar omega df star of t by dt times the state n minus 1 minus the square root of n plus 1 over h bar omega df of t by dt times the state n plus 1. Okay, so unlike in the previous case where we got this complicated expression that we didn't know what to do, for this particular time-dependent Hamiltonian, we actually can calculate what the time derivative is of these instantaneous eigenstates. Now we take that expression and we substitute it back into our original equation of motion. Let me remind you of what that was. That was this original equation up here, ih bar dcm of t by dt plus ih bar sum over n cn of t m d by dt n equals em of t cm of t. Now we recognize that there's only one term in the sum over n that is going to be present. It's the case where n is equal to, I'm sorry, when m is e yeah, when n is equal to m minus 1. That's the one contribution that we're going to get from that term. So let's evaluate exactly what that is. We're going to get a d by dt of m uh, of the state n is equal to square root of n over h bar omega df star of t with respect to time times the state n minus 1 minus the square root of n plus 1 over h bar omega df of t by dt times the state n plus 1. We substitute this into the equation above i h bar dc m of t by dt plus i h bar square root of m plus 1 over h bar omega df star of t by dt cm of t minus i h bar square root of m over h bar omega df of t by dt c m minus 1 of t equals e m of t c m of t. Okay, this is the expression that we get. Let's put a box around that. We're going to summarize that. I'll repeat it for you one more time. dc m of t by dt equals minus i over h bar e m of t c m of t minus the square root of m plus 1 over h bar omega df star of t by dt c m plus 1 of t plus square root of m over h bar omega df of t by dt c m minus 1 of t. All right, unfortunately this hasn't given us the full solution of the problem. This equation is a complicated coupled linear differential equation. It does not have constant coefficients. It has coefficients that are time dependent. They involve em of t, df star of t with respect to time, df with respect to time. 
and it really has no obvious solution when the f is not equal to zero. So although we could actually carry out the scheme that we talked about in our first lecture on time-dependent problems, all the way down to actually determining the final differential equation for the coefficients of the wave function, we still are at a loss about exactly how we could solve such an equation. Okay? And in fact, when you see what the full solution is, which we're going to cover in the second half of this lecture, what you will learn is that it really is a very complicated operator that acts on that state, and it's really a very complicated time evolution operator that we're working with. And so the solution of this differential equation that we have here, even though it looks relatively tame, is actually quite complicated. And it is not something that has a particularly simple solution that one can easily work out. Okay, we're going to pause now to take a break, and we will come back with the second half of Lecture 28.